Well, I'm really excited today to have the opportunity to interview Casey Baker from Fuji Film, and she is going to talk about the new line of products, mirrorless product line from Fuji Film, and especially the new camera um, that's creating a lot of buzz, the X Pro One. Before we do that, though, I thought it would be a good thing to cover and really talk a little bit about DSLRs versus mirrorless. There's a lot of buzz going on um, in various places. People don't really understand the difference. And to do that, I thought I'd like step back in history. So, you know, if we think back some years ago in photography, I guess many years ago, when photography was brought to the masses, cameras back then were really simple objects. Basically, they had a shutter that blocked light and a photosensitive material that reacted to light when that shutter opened. Um, but the problem with this very simple design was that it was impossible to see what you were about to expose and therefore very tough to compose a good shot. If you've ever like experimented or, you know, with pinhole cameras, you know what this is like. It's almost guesswork. So later, generations of cameras had viewfinders, um, and photographers could look through um, the viewfinders to compose their images, but this viewfinder was a completely different lens than the one that focused light on film. And since you were composing with one lens and shooting with another, this created a what we called a parallax. And simply defined, a parallax <clears throat> Um, with this type of camera is called a twin lens reflex, which means that what you see isn't what you get. And in order to solve this problem, camera engineers had to design a uh, machine that was capable of allowing photographers to see and expose through the same lens. On to single lens reflex, or SLR cameras, and they were the answer to the parallax problem. They had a clever mechanism of moving parts, and the SLRs uh, cameras reflect the light coming through the lens to the optical viewfinders and to the eye of the photographer. And when the shutter release button is pressed, the mirror moves, and that same light um, through the same uh, single lens is allowed to expose the image on the photosensitive material. Now, don't get scared by this slide. Uh, I'll go through it quickly, but hopefully it'll help you understand things. So as SLR cameras evolved, a few trends started to take place. Cameras started to normalize layouts. You know, shutter advances, shutter releases, and film storage all moved to similar locations despite the manufacturer. 35mm film became the de facto format for professional and home use, with some exceptions, obviously. But eventually, the professional photographer... Um, got interchangeable lenses, all with standard lens mounts and, and uh, the lenses tuned to the format of that specific camera. And what that meant was that a photographer could carry a single camera body and exchange lenses to shoot a variety of situations. And the camera companies had a whole new line of products to develop, manufacture, and sell to consumers. In my heyday in Kodak, I remember all the different divisions that took advantage of that. And in this age of 35 millimeter um, film photography back then, most home photographers um, likely would not need the versatility. They didn't need that for interchangeable lenses. And so instead, they opted for a more compact and simpler point and shoot camera with permanent lenses. And you know what? Even today, in today's digital market, this, uh, these same two market approaches to camera's design is actually obvious. So DSLRs, or Digital Single um, Lens Reflex, as they're branded, have continued the tradition of the interchangeable lenses, but they have the additional added bene benefits through the lens metering. In other words, reading the available light through the main lens and some auto shooting modes, uh, allowing, to the chagrin of many photographers, users of any type or skill to take better pictures. And they don't have to have much knowledge or the art or science of photography. Um, but in addition, digital cameras allow for a shorter feedback loop for those of us hoping to actually learn more. And this means we can instantly learn if our picture was good or bad. You know, and we just got to look on the back and then make changes on the fly. And in the past, however, changing ISO more or less meant changing a whole roll of film and learning what you shot wrong and then 
developing a whole roll of film and starting over again. And it, you know, it was not a nice thing at those days. But many uh, modern point-and-shoot cameras have viewfinders now with separate lenses, so we come back to the problem with parallax. However, these fixed-lens point-and-shoot cameras cleverly actually use the same lens and sensor to create an image um, on an LCD screen, thereby replacing the optical second lens viewfinder altogether. And this development is what allows the so-called mirrorless cameras to be mirrorless. So there's a whole new category in town, and it's EVIL. And EVIL stands for Electronic Viewfinder Interchangeable Lens. And as we know, DSLRs are bulky, but these are small. And their design comes from the film days, when the only way to see the exact image that would hit the film was to divert the light coming through the lens with a mirror and then send it back to the viewfinder. And <clears throat> because of this, the mirror meant the body needed to be deep and the lenses further actually away from the film. But now we can see what the sensor actually sees either on the screen, screen or through the electronic viewfinder. And now with the mirror grown, the body is much smaller, as you can see here, just like a compact digicam. But this means, you know, that you can carry it anywhere. And I don't know about you, but boy, it'd be nice to have a good high quality camera that you can stick in your pocket, you know, uh, and not have like those big bulky cameras on one side, on the left side, you know. So I think, you know, for, for many people, this might be a huge advantage. I mean, there's some people that say that if they take that at a professional type situation and people look at it, they immediately think that they're not getting the same quality of pictures. But you know what? That's not true. They take great pictures. And the trick with the new, what we'll call evil cameras, is that they have large sensors. And I'll tell you, uh, Fuji's really done a great job of this, and Casey's going to go into this much more detail when we get to the interview. And what this does is it allows them to get very high quality um, images and have um, low light sensitivity of a DSLR. So because of this and the large sensors, the depth of field is shallower, and therefore you can throw a distracting background out of focus. And for most people, that's good enough. So overall, the result is a significantly smaller camera that combines the quality of a DSLR image, but also giving users a huge upgrade in image quality without the need to change their shooting behavior. <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, with Evo cameras, the other cool things is, is that you can do is you can change lenses. Uh, Casey will talk about the three types of lenses that the Fuji cameras support. And um, they are also extremely fast. Uh, compacts have lost out to DSLRs by being slow. They're slower to power up, slow to zoom, slow to actually respond to your trigger. But evil cameras have fixed this. They are extremely um, uh, as responsive as any entry DSLR. But you do have to be concerned about what model you look for. So with a smaller camera, you can blend in. And with an evil camera, you can blend in and still get great shots. Um, People are really jumping on this. It was a very hot topic in 2011. Um, Trey Raycliffe actually wrote a blog post where he's just, you know, screaming the benefits of mirrorless cameras. Um, you can search that on Google. There are forums. I mean, Fuji actually has people that have their own dedicated forums, the X-Pro1 user forum. They have their own Facebook page. And so it really is a whole new category. And I encourage you to, you know, look at the reviews online, uh, join some of the forums, log into the Facebook, uh, you know, even on Twitter. You can follow some hashtags on mirrorless or, you know, in the case of each vendor, you can put the... the the name of that in. You can search on that. But it really, really, I believe, is going to be a whole new category. Now, there's some people that do say that it's still uh, relatively expensive. Um, they also feel that sometimes they cannot, they're not as good for, um, and, and I'm speaking of the category in general. I'm not speaking to any specific manufacturer. But there's some people that do say that they're not as well suited for sports or action photography. Um, and that they also complain about um, the struggle to focus in low light. And batteries um, so uh, sometimes have also been uh, paired back because of the size. They're very small. And finally, um, distinct lack of native lenses. But 
in many people's eyes, the pros outweigh it. With a mirror gone, the body can be smaller, just like a small compact digicam, and this means you can carry it with you everywhere and, you know, add that to your portfolio of equipment. You can take great quality pictures, um, and they use the same sensors, but Casey's going to talk a little bit about this unique sensor that Fuji has developed, which sounds really exciting. I can't wait to get into that. And the lenses are interchangeable, and they're fast and as responsive as most entry-level DSLRs. So without further ado, let me introduce Ms. Casey Baker, Director of Marketing from Fujifilm North America. That's right, guys. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to live.digitalphotographycafe.com. Um, if you're if you're online looking, go down to the very bottom. You'll see a blue button. Click that enter to win. We have a lot of great sponsor prizes that uh, we'll be giving away at the end of the show. So this segment, go ahead. Yeah, this segment, we're here with Casey Baker from Fuji, and we're going to be talking about their new camera, the <laughs> X Pro One, the mirrorless camera. Uh, you guys have just been watching the presentation that Georgia did. Um, talking about camera history and about the, the new technology. So we're going to get it right from Casey now. We're going to get some more details about it. Fantastic. Well, welcome, welcome to the show. Good Thank you. Me. Thank you for having me. So you have this, this interesting camera that I'm just... Josie? Uh, yes. I'm just <laughs> to get my you know, photographer fingers wrapped yeah. around and play with it. And yeah. I just... Uh, yeah. I understand that, by yes. the way. Yeah. <laughs> So what's, uh, what's kind of interesting and new about this camera? Well, it, um, it, it took a few things, uh, a few concepts, and kind of flipped it on its head. Um, one thing that we have to like, you know, uh, make a mention of is that this is kind of a um, uh, continuing phase in the X100 model. So we came, out with the, well, we came out with the X100, and it kind of had the same basis of a, a nice, sturdy, walk-around camera for the real photographer. Somebody, you know, photographers who really want something, they know they're going to go out, and they don't have to worry about not bringing the big camera. So if they see that really great shot, they don't have to rely on their, you know, on their phones and stuff, phone, you know. Right. They can get the really good shot and still have a nice, compact, portable camera. Well. So um, from that, we kind of then moved into the interchangeable lens market, and that's where we are with the X Pro One. Um, so we've taken some technology that, you know, mostly about the sensors. So what we really wanted to do is give is, is give the photographer a an image that would uh, rival full frame sensors. And in order to do that, we had to do some different things with the way the sensor was positioned, the way the lenses were positioned to the sensor, because talking about mirrorless, so compactness, right? So we had to get the rear element of the lenses as close as possible to, to the sensor. So what they ended up doing is they ended up realizing that the, um, uh, the low-pass filter, which is actually a pretty thick piece of glass, is sitting in front of that sensor. So in order to re you know, in order to get closer, we wanted to remove that, but the low-pass uh, filter is sitting there for a reason. It's sitting there to get rid of the moray, all that kind of funky stuff you see on, like that shirt of yours right there. That's right. And um, and false color. Um, so we went back to our film roots, and our film roots with our, you know our organic photography. There was no moray pattern. There was no false color because it's very organic. So everything's kind of randomized. So what they did is instead of going to a bare array, which is basically your you know, your red green red green, you know, gets your four pixel. They randomized it and they made it into a sixteen. So basically, it's a thirty. It's a thirty-six. It's a thirty-six pixel array. So six by six pixels, sixteen point three megapixel chip. So now everything is is much more randomized, um, and that moire and false color is gone. We got rid of the low pass uh, uh, filter, and everything sits a lot closer. So we redesigned the mount, we redesigned the lenses, and we re redesigned the uh, the data transfer. So that when the lenses are attached, everything that's in the lens gets transferred to the camera so that the optical viewfinder um, also gets the information. So the actual, um, uh, the actual size of the framing adjusts depending on which lens you put on there. So you're at 100% when you're looking through or pretty close to uh, you're about Yeah, I'd say about 80% when okay. you're looking through uh, for the optical one. There is a parallax corrector. So, you know, those of us who are familiar with, you know, just kind of like seeing things going boop. Yeah. That's it. Let me, you know what? Let me, let me ask you about those lenses. Mm -hmm. I was looking through some of those lenses and yeah. the specs on that. And like, these look pretty nice. So yeah. like one four. It's like uh, the, the, well. Again, I'm going to do this a lot. I'm going to call the. We have a 35 millimeter. Wait, 
We have an 18, a 35, and a 60 telemacro. I'm going to sometimes call it a 28, a 50, and a 90, just Based by nature, yes. Yeah. Yes, just by the, the nature of the beast. Um, so the, the 50, or the 35, uh, is a 1.4. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, 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 it's sweet. That's, that's the one that one. It was really funny because I didn't think I would like it. I, I thought because I'm, I, you know, you know, you have a desert island lens, yes, like the one yes. you have that 20 millimeter right here. So, yeah, yeah, so 20 millimeter. Um, so I thought that the 28 was going to be one that I was going to be more gravi you know, I was going to gravitate to. But that 50, uh, the the 35 with the 1.4 is so sharp. Oh, it's mm. it's it's just amazing how sharp it is, and the focus is really really nice too. Um, so anyway, so the um, uh, the 18 is a uh, 2.0. And the 60 telemacro is a 2.4. That's definitely a fast glass. Which yeah. Is a small. Thing. That's perfect. Yeah, it is. A pro can use that and get some amazing. I want, I want to use these 50 and go, go and do like a nice portrait shoot. You know, yeah. Or a fashion shoot. Right. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So for the form factor, I mean, obviously this is a, a nicer compact. Um, you know, approximately how big is it? I mean, is it, is it like. Uh, it's smaller than a bread box. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but larger than an iPhone. Okay. <laughs> um, it's a you know it, it's not a DSLR. DSLR is you know, big and bulky, and, and it can, you, your hand fits. You know, it kind of feels chunky. Right. This feels flat, kind of you know, kind of squarish to a sense, but it has a very nice it has a very nice feel to it. It doesn't feel like it's flimsy. Doesn't feel like it's made of plastic. It's made of it's made of magnesium alloy, so it has a nice sturdy feel. Right. It, it doesn't nice. feel like it's going to break. Um, can you hit somebody with it? I wouldn't recommend it, but I mean, it, it's it's sturdy enough. You can crack some heads. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so it's nice. Of it. Yeah, exactly, it's exactly, right? exactly. Yeah, it's 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 pretty it's pretty substantial. It's nice. That's nice. Yeah, I, I do like the form factor. You know, sometimes yeah. you want something that's just a little bit easier to carry with you, something a little bit easier to put in your hand, but something that's still going to make a great image. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, a lot of the, the point and shoots, I mean, they can do a decent job, but sometimes you want something just a little bit better, a little bit more, and this form factor, I really like. Yeah, I mean, they, they've redesigned the two where the, the camera itself, um, it's it's got this interesting little slant, and I talked about this before, like at CES. It, it's, um, I mean, it kind of, it kind of was, was freaky for me. I'm like, you know, why is this little slant on the camera? And they, they explained that this little slant actually was able to just move your elbow in, because normally if, you're, if your fingers are up here like this, your elbow would be up, and then you can actually just slant it and it comes back down just, just ever so slightly to kind of stabi stabilize it. It stabilizes. It stabilizes you more. And, you know, I never really thought about it, but then you start using it and you realize, oh, well, yeah. okay, got it. Yeah. That's great. The ergonomics really is important when you, when you have a camera to help avoid that fatigue. I was using your 7D yesterday with that battery pack on it. That's a lot of camera. Yeah, yeah that's that so thing's heavy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, you know, but the, just the idea that Fuji's doing that and thinking about how to stabilize a shot based on the the form factor is, is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Because yeah. we, you know, as we, we do trainings, with, you know, elbows in, keep stable, you know, right. like yeah. right. so to be able to think about that's that's. Yeah, I mean, also the other things, and uh, with that chip and with that technology, we've also been able to get high, you know, really amazing results with high ISOs. So we have a, a 25.6 ISO in the um, uh, in the camera, and it's been able to get some some quite sub quite substantially nice results. Not a lot of moraine, not a lot of that you know extra little you know colorful noise that you usually get in the in the gray areas. Uh, you know, there's some there, obviously, but not to the degree that you would see normally and not patterned in the same way. Right. The patterning is where you get right. the bomb. And right. at 1.4, you're wide open. I mean, you could probably shoot, let's say, 1,600 at 1.4, and you don't even need a flash in this, you know, this one. So yeah. That's, uh, and for such a small camera that you normally would only see that in, let's say, a full frame, yeah. quote unquote, full frame DSLR. Yeah, I mean, especially for wedding photographers. I, I was mean, say. yeah, I mean, wedding photographers. I mean, this lens ratio, this lens offering, it is uh, is perfect in the sense that it, it does a few things. Like the 1.4, you know, you're at, you're at the, you know you're in the church, you got the candlelight, there's no flash, and so on and so forth. You get some really beautiful stuff, you know, and you can because of the uh, the lens is so fast and the ISOs are so good. Uh, then you got your, you know, your 60 millimeter, where you get the little portrait situation there, and you got the wide right. angle. I mean, it's, it's, um, and of course the macro for all the That's detail the shots macro. of the rings the and so yeah. on. Right, right. And we have video. And this, and there's video, and there's video. Um, <laughs> it, it is a little secondary on this camera because it's sure. actually we, we're kind of designing things to be more of, um, you know, the shooter's camera, not yes. so much the videographer's camera. Yes. And um, I know, you know, everybody wants video and cameras nowadays, but you know, we're focused on color. 
you know, Fujifilm's color has been, you know, the best from point A to point B. You know, here in the booth we have uh, our, our color paper samples, so you know you can go straight from the camera to the paper and you really don't have to worry about the color thing. There's color profiles in the camera for our film, so like um, our 400H and our 160C are in there now. Um, so yeah, so you actually be able to kind of, you know, replicate that type of look. Um, so color, technology. So let me ask you, as a pro, most of the time I will go and download an ICC profile, mm -hmm. right? Because I want to see what I'm going to right. get before I get it. Right? Right. So I capture the image, download the ICC, I'll take a look at the picture, take a look at what it looks like, I know when it prints. So is that something that, is it, are we able to look at, uh, how, does, how does that work as far as... Well, it, it, it's, it's kind of wild um, because, like I said, we have a frontier here. Sure. So I, uh, I went out shooting on Saturday. Took the lenses out, went down to whatever, El Dorado Canyons, got all these kind of funky things. Okay, yeah. No, 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 I, I went down there. I thought okay. everybody was there. I, I get down there and there's like, you know, 100 people there shooting. And there's a bride in the middle of the street. I'm like, okay, all right, we're at the right place. Right, right. So, um, so we get out and there's been beautiful, the golden lights coming out. And it's just, it's perfect, right? So I brought them back, dumped them on my, on my Mac Air, you know, kind of looking through them and everything. And uh, didn't do any adjustments, nothing straight, you know, uh, you know, this the straight RGB, sRGB. Right. Took them, put them on a card, brought them to the booth, popped them in, printed it out, they look fab. And right. so no ICC profile, I mean, and again, yeah, I'm not saying absolutely. it's, it, I, color profiling is very important, no sure, doubt about it, sure, sure. but, you know, with our frontier, the way we go from camera from Fuji to, to Fuji to you got Fuji. It. Yes. Yeah. It, it's like, it's, you know, right yeah, out. You, you can buy the booth, you can check them out, I mean, it's yeah. like straight out of the camera. Well, we'll do that. We're going to be coming over. We're going to check out your booth. We're going to check out the hardware. Actually, get a get it in hands camera, on. Sorry, get a hands on, <laughs> and uh, and we can talk a little bit more about the integration with the print process. Yeah, which I think would be great. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds so, great. Thanks well, for thank joining us, for Casey. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me. Sorry, I didn't bring the camera. Just a little short-handed over there. No, that's all right. We'll, all right. we'll get our hands we're, on. We're, yeah. we're all right, cool. All right, cool. All right, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.